Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another author chat, Black Men Read author chat. We have a great guest with us today. Um, today we are speaking with Dr. Carolyn Finney, who is the author of our May book pick, book club pick, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors. And so my name is Raymond Williams. I'm one of the book club admins. And this is, oh, you're on mute, Corbin. Of course I am. <laughs> my name is Corbin Ford. I'm forced to be another um, member of the book club admin here at Blackman Reads. And I'm just excited uh, to be here tonight. All right. So everybody who is here, thank y'all for joining us. Um, if you have questions, comments, put them in the comment section. We will try to an answer any or ask any of your questions as they come in. Um, how tonight is going to work is we're going to have questions for the author. Uh, but before we're going to begin with a bio of her that I found on her website, um, I uh, shortened it just a, a tad bit, but um, I'll be reading that and then we'll get into the conversation. All right. So Dr. Carolyn Finney is a storyteller, author, actor, and a cultural geographer who is deeply interested in issues related to identity, difference, creativity, and, re and resilience. The aim of her work is to develop greater cultural competency within environmental organizations and institutions, challenge media outlets on their representation of difference, and increase awareness of how privilege shapes who gets to speak to environmental issues and determine policy and action. Carolyn is grounded in both artistic and intellectual ways of knowing. She pursued an acting career for 11 years, but five years of backpacking trips through Africa and Asia and living in Nepal changed the course of her life. Motivated by these experiences, Carolyn returned to school after a 15 year absence to complete a BA MA, both of those of these degrees focus on gender and environmental issues in Kenya and Nepal, respectively, and a PhD which focused on African Americans and environmental issues in the United States. She has been a Fulbright scholar, a Canon National Park Science scholar, received a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship in environmental studies. Um, she has been published in Outside Magazine, Newsweek, The Guardian, New York Times, and more. She filmed a commercial for Toyota that highlighted the importance of African Americans getting out into nature. She has held positions at Wellesley College, the University of California, Berkeley, the University of Kentucky, and she served on the U.S. National Park System Advisory Board for eight years, which assists the National Park Service in engaging in relations of reciprocity with diverse communities. She is currently working on a performance piece entitled The N-Word, Nature Revisited, as part of a Mellon residency at the New York Botanical Gardens. Along with being the new columnist at the Earth Island Journal, she was recently awarded the Alexander and uh, Elise Melod Melamid Medal from the American Geographical Society and is an artist in residence and the environmental studies professor of practice in the Franklin Environmental Center at Middlebury College. Her first book, Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagine the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors was published in 2014 by UNC Press. So everybody, welcome Dr. Finney to our conversation tonight. <laughs> So, <laughs> I know. I do have to clap. Yay! I'm glad to I was be like, I want to be too loud. Yes. <laughs> so, before we get into the questions, I wanted to um, uh, spotlight one of our members. So, one of our book club members, MJ Good Leap, was the one who suggested your book to us. We did. We hadn't. We weren't familiar with it before. And so he told us we should read this book. And we were like, yeah, we're going to read this for our book club pick, um, you know, next year. And so we knew we had to we knew we had to pick it. Uh, Black Faces, White Spaces is a fascinating book that examines the historical and structural reasons why we don't see a lot of black people in the great outdoors. Finney tells the story through interviews, content analysis of Nature magazines and brochures, 
spotlighting notable black people who have strong connections with nature and even shares her own story. So Corbin, start us off. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm glad you gave the, the kind of background to the book, Raymond, because that's kind of based on my first question. When we first um, were kind of introduced to the book and I saw it, I was like, wow, this is a very interesting topic that I've kind of passed through my brain. Like, wow, I wonder how just how people feel about the outdoors. I have my own thoughts and that of my peers, but just seeing in the book and, and going into reading it, it, it led me to my first question, which is, you know, with the topic that's really such a layered issue, um, what was your writing process in terms of contextualizing and incorporating your own personal relationship with nature, with the great outdoors throughout the book? Because you do go into some of, you know, your childhood and upbringing and your relationship there. And in such a text as this, where you're able to kind of weave it in and out, how were you able to, yeah, really just kind of draw from your own experiences and yet meld it into a book of, of this type? Okay, I got most of that question. So I'm going to the internet okay. goes in and out for me here, but I think what I I heard you ask me, Corbin, was how was I able to interject my own experience into this in talking about the wider experience? And and I want to be really clear, I must I cannot nor would I ever try to speak for all Black people, right? So I was trying to, but I was trying to challenge a, a narrative in this country about the environment that seems to leave our collective stories out as though we're, we somehow haven't always been there, you know, aren't there now, right? And aren't thinking about nature because, you know, we all need nature to survive. I always say to everybody, are you breathing? Well, then, you know, you're part of nature, like you're there, right? Everybody has a story. So part of the reason I wasn't able to leave it is because I, it's, it's one of the things I say to people, this work, so this is what I spend my full time doing. I mean, I know you just read that much too long, bio of mine right? and to say that all uh, this is what i do all the time i work all the time and i love what i do i get exhausted by it because there's a lot of emotional labor involved but this is what i do and, and in many different capacities and i'm really grateful that i've reached a point where i'm able to pay the rent by doing something that i love and believe in but this work is personal for me so yeah it's professional it's also political but it's also personal you know and i really challenge the idea that we can take an objective, that anyone can be objective about race, about the environment, about black people, about any people, as though we can sort of stand outside of it and look at it and, and have no relationship to that, that we don't have a point of view. I always say everybody's biased and bias is neither good nor bad. We, it's just a perspective you have based on how you've grown up, you know, your own experience of the world. It can tip over into something else and we can have that conversation. But I'm biased too. So one of the things I do is I don't come into that. I, I didn't come into writing that book, which was largely academic. It's not the book I wanted to write, but at the time I was in an academic institution that needed me to write it in a more academic sense. I walked the line really tightly, which is why I wove my story in. But I also wove it in to make a point. You need to know who's writing it. Yes, I've done the research. Yes, I've been rigorous about it. You know, yes, I've got my academic bona fides in place, but it's also a point of view. And so I'm going to pretend that I'm some invisible author that's talking about a thing that has no relationship to me. I cannot talk about black people in America without talking about myself because I am a black person in America, right? And I've grown up that way. So I do it for that reason. I do it also to invite everyone else to consider their own story because I believe everyone's story has value. And in each of our own lives, our stories are center stage. You know, we're not, you know, you think about your own life, right? You're not backdrop to your story. You are the story <laughs> and you kind of interact with everybody and everything else in it. And so for me, it's that invitation. I also do it because I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. As black people, we historically have never, usually aren't centered in any story. Mm. You know, recent, in recent times, since 2020, there's been some sh significant shift, but historically, we're often not at the center of any story, right? So all I was doing was saying, you know, in 2003, when I thought about doing this as a dissertation, because it became personal when my parents had to leave this land that they had cared for for 50 years that never belonged to them. When I went to the library shelves, I could find almost nothing on African-Americans in the environment, on the, on the university shelf. 
unless I found, oh, something bad happened to our one of our communities. And what I always say is, we're not just the bad things that happen to us. Where are our stories of resilience? Where are our stories of joy in nature? Our stories of adventure, our stories of um, just however, you know, we come to learn about ourselves out in the world because we've done it too. You know, we're not new to the game. You know, we've always been in the game. And some people might make the point that we help make the game, right? And sometimes we are the game, right? And so I'm really trying to find, that's really what I was trying to do. I mean, there's a lot of answers I can give, but you know, there's the other thing I wanna say about that is, I read an article about a year ago in a journal where it was a black writer who had written the article and she was challenging the fact, she was talking about black representation and why it is so important to have that representation regardless of whatever it is you're talking about. And she talked about the Jewish writer and thinker, Fran Leibowitz, who was having a conversation with the black writer, Toni Morrison. And Fran Leibowitz was saying, I don't understand why everybody wants to see themselves in a book because books aren't supposed to be a mirror. Books are supposed to be a door. And the black author, Maura Cheeks, who had written, was writing the article, was making the point of saying, you know, I get the argument she's making, but she clearly doesn't get it because she's always been represented, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Later on, when Fran Leibowitz was talking to Toni Morrison, she said it again. She said to Toni Morrison, you know, you're not the reader of your books. You know, why, why does everybody got to see themselves in books? You're not the reader. How Toni Morrison replied was, she said, oh, yes, I am the reader. And she said, and that's what Fran couldn't understand. I'm also the reader of that book. You know, I'm also, I want to see myself in it because I never see myself in it. That's right. Wow. Thank you. Right? Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to, <laughs> there, there's so many directions we can go, right? Um, yeah. so I think I want to yeah. continue with your, the stories of, of black joy in nature, right? Um, and that was, like you said, probably some of the best parts of the book because I had never heard of any of those stories with the exception of two or three. Um, what was the, what was that research process like of finding those stories? Like, did you, were there many that you couldn't put in the book or was it, you know, talk, talk to us a little bit about that. That I have to tell you. So here I was working on my doctorate. My doctorate started out to be about gender and conservation issues in Nepal, in the country of Nepal, because I had been living there. I built relationships there. I got the Fulbright to do it there. It was 2001. And when I went over the royal family, there had just been assassinated in Nepal. I, the, I I was supposed to have flown over the 9-11. This is when my parents were still in New York. And I ended up having to wait a few weeks before I could, you know, take a plane anywhere. And I, my parents were about to have to move off the land. And so I want to say that when I started off, I wasn't going to do my research on black people and the, and the environment. I was thinking I was going, coming to that later. I started to think about it. Like, you know, it was just coming up for me all over the place. But I got this Fulbright. So who walks away from that? So I went to Nepal to do it. The short of it is that uh, politically, I couldn't stay in the country but seven months because a group called the Maoists broke a ceasefire there. It made it very difficult for me to go to my field site. My advisor was like, why don't you come back and, and do that research on African-Americans because nobody's doing it. And I support you. She goes, I, I, I don't know anything about it, but I'll support you to do it. So when I came back, I, I, was, I got really depressed because I had to write a whole new research proposal, which took me a year. I had to see if I could get any funding. I didn't think anybody was going to fund me. So all these things were in my head. I'm thinking about what I want to do, which is really talk to black people, interview them formally. But really what I want to do is hear around the country their stories. You know, what's your story of the environment, of nature? Because you got one. Everybody does. You, 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 you relied upon it. You grew up in it. Your grandmother's garden. It doesn't matter where. You know, an urban park. It doesn't matter where it was. You've got a story. And um, the short of it is I ended up getting over $100,000 in funding. So what happened was that and that enabled me, instead of calling people on the phone to have a story, that I could fly everywhere that people were, meet them, spend a couple of days with them and hear their story. So first of all, that elevated everything, right? Cause I could do it in person. 
Secondly, I went down to live in Florida for a year and I chose to live in Florida because of the significant African-American population. But, you know, Zora Neale Hurston was driving me like her stories. She was like my muse. I'd be like, Zora, what should I be doing? What would Zora be doing? I should have gotten out of my license plate. You know, what would Zora do? Because I was really <laughs> thinking that way about it. Um, and also because it was near three national parks, the Everglades, Big Cypress National Preserve and Biscayne National Park. So I was thinking about national parks because I was thinking about American identity. And where's the black story in that? Like I wanted to kind of understand where black people kind of fit in there. I have to tell you that the universe, whatever you want to call it, must was aligning because I was meeting people almost by accident. I, you know, I was in so First of all, I had to get a community partner. I decided that I didn't want to do it the old way, where you go into a community, you take the information, you extract it, and you leave. I wanted to find a black person who I knew was doing this work in real life on the ground who might connect me to people. I wanted to do it through relationships. That's how I met Audrey Peterman. Audrey Peterman, Jamaican-American, her and her husband, Frank, they've been doing this work for years as activists and writers, Earthwise Productions. If you Google Audrey, she just won a huge award. Washington DC. She's amazing. I Googled her because I was, I, I literally put in African Americans in the environment just to see who would come up. Her name came up. I wrote her a letter saying, I'm, I'm doing this work and da, 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 this is who I am. She wrote me back. She was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. We're sisters. I love you. Okay. Yes. We're doing this. My best friends now. But she became my community partner and she knew everybody. She was one of the people who connected me. It's like, here's you, you got to talk to this person. This person has been an activist. This person's been around a long time. At the time, her and her husband, Frank, lived in Atlanta. And so sometimes when I visit, I would go stay in their apartment. And one day I was staying there and I was reading a book I had just gotten. It was called American Beach, a saga of race, wealth, and memory. And I heard about this amazing black woman named Mavin Betch who had been from a wealthy black family who had given away all her wealth to environmental causes. And I, I, I said to Audrey, I said, oh my God, this is an amazing woman. I'd love to interview her. Have you ever heard of her? And she just looked at me and like, I know Maveen, I can hook you up, right? <laughs> Next thing you know, I meet Maveen. And Maveen was like, child, you better interview me. She literally, and I was like, so then I got to know Maveen and then I'm being filmed with Maveen because there's a film being made of her life. I'm finding myself at the Audubon Nature Center. And someone said, you know, you need to meet one of the um, highwaymen. They're a group of black painters who painted the Florida landscape in the 50s and 60s, all men except for one woman. And let me introduce you. There's one here. He's here today. And next thing I know, I'm going out on a canoe ride with him and one of his children because he wants to make sure that I'm cool. And he says, OK, I'm going to introduce you to four more and our wives. And, and then I had this two, three hour conversation with them. I met one of the Tuskegee Airmen. Somebody was like, you're going to meet, he's here. He's doing agriculture. He's a Tuskegee Airman. So I'm sitting in his trailer having a conversation with one of the Tuskegee. Yeah. And that's how it happened. I could not fit everybody in there. It was like I kept, I would say, I want to meet somebody. The next thing I know, you know, Valerie Boyd, the incredible black writer who just died a few months ago, who's the only black biographer of Zora Neale Hurston. I met her at the Zora Neale Hurston Festival that happens every year in, um, uh, in Eatonville, uh, in Florida. And it's a week long festival. It's amazing. And she, I, I saw her wearing the tag. I knew who she was. She's like, who are you? And we started talking and I'm telling her I'm doing this research. She says, you know, you need to meet Eddie Harris. You know, Eddie Harris, Eddie Harris is the black man who at 30, he canoed the length of the Mississippi river. His first book is called Mississippi solo. I knew exactly who he was. I had read the book. I've been trying to find him for a year. She hooked me up like that. Next thing I know, she's out of her mess. Because you know, you need to talk to Evelyn C. White. She's the black writer who wrote, and I was like, I've been trying to reach Evelyn C. White. Hook me up just like that. Then Evelyn C. White invited me out to her place in Canada on Salt Spring Island. Meanwhile, I go to Salt Spring Island. Who does she connect me with? The, the great, great granddaughter of Sylvia Stark, who was a black woman who was a homesteader back in the 1800s, who moved all the way to Salt Spring Island and is actually on their money. She's on their $5 bill on Salt Spring Island. Like, I see, I can keep going. This is what the research was like for wow. a year. And you know, I, I, can, I can point to that year and say, I, it was clearer, I was, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I get so excited, excuse me. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. 
it just kept happening like that. And even my my graduate school friends who were working on their research was going, Wait, how is this happening for you? Like, how is this your research? You know, so from a year earlier when I was in a country that it wasn't working, I couldn't get my research done and I got depressed because I'm thinking, how am I going to finish my dissertation? I can't borrow any more money from the government. You know, like, what's happening to getting all that funding and then more importantly, meeting all the queen, queen quet of the Gullah Geechee Nation. I mean, it just kept going. So oh, wow. I, I could have kept doing that research and that was for the dissertation. That's not even when I went back a couple of years later and said, now I'm going to turn it into a book. Right. So the dissertation was just the foundation. Um, and, and I want to say this too. One of the things I heard so often was from black people that I talked to was no one's ever asked me this before. Nobody's ever asked me about my story and my experience. And that's the thing that moved me so much. Not that there weren't any stories. I knew, of course, there were millions of them because we all have stories, but that no one had ever asked. And then you get right. these incredible stories, you know? Yeah. Mm. I just want to say one more because I have to give a shout out. She's no longer alive, but um, oh my God, not Leola. You know how in the beginning of my book, where's a copy of my book at? Right here. I, 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 I got, you know, I, I have a dedication and I, I often don't say anything. And everyone I've dedicated it to there, aside from my parents, none of them are alive anymore. Mm. And none of them are alive. And one of them, Frances Hodges, I had this picture where Frances Hodges was living by herself. She was 92. And she, her family had fashioned for her this adult tricycle because she liked to go fishing. So she had every day. So she had her big tricycle with a basket in the front with her fishing rod. You know, she lived in Florida and she would take herself down to the water and, you know, go fishing. Right. And those were the kinds of stories that I really wanted to say, you know, it was so powerful to see this 92 year old woman was doing her thing out in nature. Right. right. With nobody's permission, just her own. That's so cool. Mm. That is so wow. cool. Wow. I, I mean, just those stories, it, when you talk about how one branched to another to another was insane. And, and I guess just further illustrates that, like you said, there are these stories to be told or to be shared that aren't really yeah. there. Or they're, they're there, but they aren't really like readily available, you know? Um, and honestly, uh, again, another... Well, uh, actually, another, Corbin, uh, Corbin, I would push back. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say something. They, oh, I, yeah. they are readily, they are, I would say they are readily available. Again, if we look at, you know, systems, whether it's people who make movies, whether it's the publishing industry, whether it's our education systems, all which promote and sell and elevate certain stories, yeah. narratives of who we are, who we want to be, how we should do things. I'm not, what I'm trying to say here, let me, I'm going to be very gentle about it and say that when you have been relegated to the backdrop of history, mm -hmm. either because historically you haven't been seen as having any value in being important or it becomes too difficult to actually deal with you because then you have to deal with your own com com complicity in our collective oppression right so you have to deal with it one way or the other yeah you don't want to tell those stories it's not that the stories aren't readily available we've never we've always been here it's like any group actually it's like the indigenous folks of this country it's like people of asian descent it's like it's like latinx you could continue and continue I actually don't want to perpetuate the idea that our stories are hard to get because that that's the excuse that many have used to not promote who we are in relationship with everybody else. Boy, I got a, I got an attitude there. Did you see that? <laughs> I liked it. You know, it's funny. You told me. I, told me. <laughs> I did too. That was actually my second question. It was like, okay. And I guess the way I framed it, I'm glad you corrected me on that because the way I was framing it and asking was going to say, you know, the dearth of material between the relationship of African Americans and the environment. You're saying it right there. That, and I guess that is my second question. Why do we think that's a reoccurring issue? Well, I guess the first part is, you know, that would again speak on the kind of trauma that we are a part of that those complicit don't want to share. So thank you for not only, you know, helping me rephrase that better in the understanding, but also answering my question before I got it. <laughs> I am. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I had um, recently, I actually found a, a story, well, not found the story, but I read about a story recently from my home state that I didn't know about. Um, 
and that uh, a friend of mine gave me this magazine did not know I was reading your book right and it was um our our state North Carolina's magazine and so their issue was the state it was the state parks issue and so they had an essay in there about um Joan was Jones Lake which was a which was was the first um uh state park owned prim first by African Americans then it got sold into the the park system for the state and I asked my parents about it. They didn't even know about it either. Cause you know, I'm thinking maybe, you know, my youth, you know, I wasn't around at that time. So of course I wouldn't have know about, about it. So I, I agree with you, you know, that point that you were making that, you know, the stories are there, you know, we just haven't been actually, you know, looking for them for the most part, right? They've always been there. So, um, that wasn't even a question. I just kind of wanted to put that statement there. But, <laughs> <laughs> so um, right. let's see. I want to, since we talking about, mag since I brought up a magazine, um, I yeah. really, for me, I kind of nerded out on the content analysis part where you did the, the study of, or the um, yeah. content analysis of the outside magazine for yeah. 10 years. And you found like, 2% yes. of them, of the Black people were pictured in those magazines. I was curious, have you done like another sample of that since the book's been published? Or have you, do you have any anecdotal information about whether or not rep, the representation in those types of magazines have gotten better since you did, the, did that part of the, of the book? Well, I can tell you that I have a relationship with outside magazines. So, the, re the reason I chose outside in part was because when I was doing all that backpacking for five years back and forth, I was saving my money, then going off for six months to Africa or doing, and I kept doing all of that. And this was late eighties, early nineties. And I wanted to write a book about my experience with that. I read hundreds of books of people doing adventures. I could never find a book of anyone who looked like any one of the three of us in any of those books doing anything like that, mm -hmm. nor could I find it in outside. And I liked outside because it had a lot of those kinds of stories. And so by the time I got to the dissertation, I said, well, I, maybe if I should just count, if I take 10 years worth of the magazine and I start to see, you know, basically how many pictures we have, you know, if there's 6,000 photos, how many pictures have people in them, how many times we see men, women, and children. And at the time I wasn't thinking non-binary, you know, in terms of gender, I just thinking men, women, and children. And if we see men, women, or children, can we tell if they're in an urban, rural, or suburban setting? And what are they doing exactly? Because what I was trying to get to is how many times do we see black people and when we do, what are they doing? How are they in the outdoors? How are they portrayed as being in the outdoors? And what I was seeing mostly was well-known male black sports figures in urban settings. That's mostly what I was seeing in their magazine at the time. Now, a few years, maybe a couple of years after the books came out, Outside Magazine actually cited me saying that mm -hmm. about them. And, and they were like, well, you know, we got to do something different. So they started asking uh, folks of color, writers of color like myself and um, Jose Gonzalez and James Mills, people of color who write about these things, to write articles about being black or brown in the outdoors and putting, and putting them in their magazine. So I started to see that as like, okay, they're trying to. They even, there was a roundtable discussion they had with us that they then published in the magazine, you know, to have a, to show that they're having these conversations and understanding that it's a process. You don't change overnight. You actually engage change as a constant. So how are you going to show up in it? And actually it's not for them to make all the decisions because that's how it's, it's actually, you've got to change the way it looks, who gets to make even the decision of what the vision is and what does it mean for us to be part of a story um, and maybe even be the story sometimes. Since then, they've had um, black and brown folks on the cover of Outside Magazine. And I'm actually having a conversation with somebody at Outside right now because I owe her an email. I told her by the end of today and I still haven't done it. But I need to, you know, because asking would I write a piece of uh, there's some new show out and they'd like me to review it. So what I see just from my own anecdotal evidence and for myself and others of color that I know who engage with them, what I appreciate about outside, they're taking, they're doing the work. You know, I'm not saying that there isn't anything to be critical about. I'm saying they're doing the work. 
<laughs> and they seem to be, and part of doing the work is building relationship, meaning you're building relationship with those, you know, it's not simply putting our picture on the cover or telling one anecdotal story about us, but actually in all parts of creating a narrative, such as a magazine, we start showing up in all parts of that making, if that makes sense, right? We're, we're the editors. We become, you know, we're not just the story, we're the editors, we're the photographers, you know, all the aspects of making a story. You know, we start to become part of that because not just for our sakes, but also for everyone else at the table. I always say, look, if you have one group at the table where everybody looks the same, they're gonna have some good things to say, right? It doesn't matter what color their skin is, they're gonna have some good things to say, but they cannot be expected to be able to say everything about everyone because their experience is going to be limited. And then if you add to that the complications of power and privilege here in this country around race, I don't care how liberal you say you are, right? You know, privilege has the privilege of not seeing itself. So how would you and why would you even consider another point of view when you haven't had to this entire time? And then even when you try, because I work with a lot of predominantly white in organizations who tell me that they're afraid, they don't, they're not even sure how to do it. And I said, of course you're not sure how to do it. You haven't had to do it. Why would you be sure? So how do you sort of build your capacity to actually show up and leverage your position and your power, right? So that others of us who do know how to do it, why? Because we've been doing it for 400 years. So we got some ideas. <laughs> right. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was, yeah. That, that was, <laughs> the quote you had me about privilege, I was still wrapping my head around it. I was, I was pretty moving there. <laughs> um, I actually want to ask a question. It's, it's going back to your book, but I guess it's something, again, a few quotes, a few yeah. chapters, I'm sure Raymond could say the same, like, hit me kind of deep. Um, whether it was talking about John Moore and, and some of the, I was only kind of had a baseline awareness of him, but some of the heavily racist views he kind of had regarding African-Americans and, and nature and, and, and such. But one chapter I really kind of gravitated toward uh, was chapter four, Black Faces, which obviously explored, among other things, um, Hurricane Katrina and the resulting like cultural misrepresentation of Blackness from the images and the video that made the rounds after that. Um, and that led to my question here, which is, was there a chapter for you? I mean, it was emotionally hard for me to read that one. Was there a chapter for you that was emotionally hard to produce, whether it was from a personal reason or simply from just the subject matter that you were diving into as you went and, and wrote the book? So if Corbin, if I, if I heard you correctly, you're asking me, was there a chapter that was harder or was particularly challenging for me to engage with in terms of the subject matter? Exactly. Is that what I was hearing? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, see, I know you must be from the South. You just were like, yes, ma'am. I heard that. <laughs> God damn. My family, my mom, grandma, all of them. I'm from New York, but yeah. Yes, 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 yes. North Carolina. Um, oh, man, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that. That's funny. I don't, you know, I would, I think where I had the greatest challenge, the two places I had the greatest challenge was how to start the book. Mm-hmm and how to finish it. And I say that because, in part because the way that I wanted to write it, so I'm working on my second book, which talks about these issues, but more in a memoir fashion. That's the book I actually wanted to write in the way, but I, I was trying to get tenure and I was in the academy and I, you know, there was a way that I was being forced to sort of work and write it, right? So how do I start the story knowing that I wanted to ground it in, you notice I started off with talk talking about how I come to the book because that's, I want it to start from the personal because I wanted people to not be able to simply engage their intellect. For, for this kind of material, I think people have to be willing to open their heart to it because some of the stuff is hard to hear. Some of it's hard to hear, you know, the truth of who we've been collectively as a country and because I, I'm speaking very particularly about black people, but it's not only about black people, right? It's just, you know, how we have treated each other, the lack of humanity, you know, that has been present. The idea that all this land is stolen and no matter how far down the line we get, all this land will always be stolen, right? To a people who are still here trying to get us to understand that, right? To understand that, that those complications and those complexities are here. And I, so I, I struggled with how to start that 
and how to hold that. Whereas I'm, I have to singularly be talking about black people. So I can't go so far off. And yet I have to, have to, I have to point to that. You know, I have to point to my indigenous brothers and sisters here, right, who have something to say and have more to say, actually, I'm just going to say, because they've been here for like a thousand years, right? So really, how do I point to that without, you know, so I don't disrespect it. And yet I want to focus the camera on our collective black experience because it's so rarely focused on that. Um, So that was hard for me. And still my own, one of my own critiques of the book is that I I didn't do a great job at that. It's like, I didn't know how, I'd never written a book before and I didn't know know how to get that and also stay true to what I know and understand and want to talk about. And so it was also harder. uh, I will say the last chapter. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, because I have to tell you that. So chapter six, um, that I say, uh, I call it, I, I use a, a Zora Neale uh, Hurston quote for that chapter. I'm going to it right now. I've just blanked out on it. Um, what do I call that? Oh, uh, uh, I call it the church. I say, yes, that one. Um, the sanctified church house it is. When I, was yeah. writing, when I was writing this book, I had to have two anonymous reviewers because it was going through an academic review. And I will tell you that because the universe and God, they all have a sense of humor. One of those reviewers happened to be black and one happened to be white. Now, and they both happened to be men. I happened to figure out who they both were because as professors and writers themselves, they had been both supportive of me as a graduate student. Um, I liked their work. I respected both of the work that they did in the world. The black reviewer revealed himself to me immediately. He said, he said I'm not going to act like I'm anonymous. I want to work with you and I'm going to have some things to say, but I want this to be good. So we're going to have a conversation. And I love that because I said, actually, the whole anonymous reviewer thing for me is problematic because it allows us not to take responsibility for what it is we're saying and how we're saying it to the person we're saying it to. Um, the white reviewer, I figured out who it was. And when I approached him like, hey, it's you. He didn't want me. He was like, no, we can't. We can't. We can't do that. And I went, oh, my God, that's so weird. So so I had to pretend like I didn't know who it was when I knew who it was. So when it got to and he he spent a lot of time, he gave me a lot of feedback. I could see he really thought he really thought about it, but he really didn't like the way I was writing the book. He didn't like the personal. He didn't like that. You know, I was writing it with stories. Um, And one of the things he challenged me on in chapter six was he said, why can't you say more about how black people are afraid of the outdoors? Mm -hmm. He wanted more. He goes, you can do it. You can do an entire chapter on how black people are afraid. And I have to tell you that when I first read the comment, I just I bristled. (laughs) I read that and, and it didn't. Like I, it made me kind of mad and I got all upset around like, why am I so, that, that triggered me <laughs> in a big way. And it took a while to work it out. I couldn't respond to his comment for days because I needed to think it through why I was so upset. Mm-hmm. And I realized a couple of things. I said, one, you know, you see that I used the, the quote at the very beginning of that chapter is a paragraph from Dr. Joy Degree Leary from her book, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. I said, cause she said it all right there. I said, first of all, I've already talked about all the things we've been traumatized by. Slavery, redlining, Jim Crow, being seen as less than human, not being represented. <laughs> it's laid out, you know, number one. Number two, we are not just the bad things that happen to us. We are not just about our fear. The point I'm trying to make here is that the in spite of and despite that fear, how we've shown up anyway, the the point is the resilience of that, not to deny the fear, is the courage, the creativity, the adaptability, the improvisation, the kind of jazz that we played as we move through our lives. It is not about a chapter of our fear. And I am not going to give another chapter because that's not for black people. There is not a single black person that I've ever met that needs you to tell them about their fear. There's not a single black person. And I'm not saying I've talked to every black person who's ever lived, but I'd I'd be willing to hold 
that most black people don't want to talk about their fear. They don't need to. If you've been paying attention, you can understand that they live that in their lives. But that's not all of who they are. Black joy is actually a thing. It is tangible and real. Courage is tangible and real. Black people are complicated and complicated complex, just like everyone else. And I wanted to spend a chapter talking about how we are resilient in spite of. And I know he didn't like that. So I spent half a page saying, here's why I'm not going to talk about it. Because Mm. here it all is. Dr. Joy Degree Leary said it brilliantly. And now I can go on and talk about what we have been doing anyway. And that was actually the hardest. That was the second hard, the first hardest, even more than starting the book, was being able to say that. And I still don't feel like I gave it everything it needed. But that's that's pretty much why I'm doing the rest of what I'm doing out in the world is to say that, mm-hmm. right? And who we are in our fullness and our wholeness. Well, in, in that chapter, I, I like the way you told us that that you know you had a pivot, right? Because you you taught you addressed the fear part. And then I love the um, introduction of the Great Dismal Swamp and how what that related to the Maroons who escaped there. And yet, and you talked about, I remember how you talked about um, all the dangers that were there, but they still build that community. And and I love you how you use that as the pivot to those people that you highlighted later in the book. So I, I thought that, I mean, the whole book is great. But the way you did that last chapter, because I didn't, when I was reading that fear part, I'm like, well, where, where are we going here? Uh, but I didn't see you were going, where you were going. And so that was, that was a nice surprise from, from my yeah. Point of view. yeah. Well, that, and that was it. And, and I have to say, you know, some years passed by and I would say that that same reviewer, you know, emailed me in the fall of 2020. So now we have the murder of George Floyd. We have Christian Cooper having his skin weaponized against him in Central Park. And suddenly, even, you know, the opportunities and for me to talk with everything exploded and just the way that I'm able to do this work in the world because so many, particularly predominantly white and institutions and organizations, museums, businesses are either choosing to think about it or feeling forced to think about it. And that same reviewer wrote me and he actually said, you know, because he had pushed back really hard on the book. And he said, wow, he goes, your work was really prescient. You know, he's like, you kind of knew what was coming. And what I wanted to say to him was, right, but what I wanted to say was, I wasn't talking about what was coming. I'm telling you what was and has always been. It was right there in front of you. You just didn't have to see it. And and, and I'm telling you that. And I have to tell you that in a way that I want to tell you, you know, with story. You know, I'm not trying to be objective because I'm not objective, which doesn't mean I'm not rigorous. (laughs) How can I possibly be objective? in a story about black people in the United States. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's the truth, yeah. Right. Wow. (laughs) Corbin, you got a question? It's on me? Okay, great. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I I have a few, okay. So a lot of the, I guess my thoughts were, you know, around representation, um, around natural yeah. spaces. I thought that was interesting as well. And you, you know, talked about that between the National Park Services and just outdoor magazine. There were several instances where this was brought up. Um, I guess I wanted to look at kind of projecting. Um, I thought it was a cool idea when I wrote this down. I was like, over oh, the next eight years, the 2020s. <laughs> but like, what are you hoping will kind of change in the culture of representation in relation to our natural spaces and preserves and how uh, the collective, how we're marketed in that? Um, Because a lot of, I know you were kind of talking about how we are represented in that, in that space. And, you know, I, working in libraries, we have like natural park passes and stuff that we do. And I've gotten drugs myself, like, oh, you don't go to the parks. I'm like, well, you know, I actually do dabble. Like in terms of being in that space, um, what do you hope is going to change in that representation? I I didn't catch that end, but I think what I heard you Um, say was, you know, what do I see, you know, in terms of what's changing in the space of representation around African Americans, around Black people in the outdoors, just in general, I think that's what you yeah. were asking me. You nail it every time. Yeah, yes. uh, <laughs> I actually think. Well, first of all, um, I mean, I think it is. 
I can say personally, but I also know for the circle that I'm in, of those of us who do this kind of work um, that identify as black and brown, in the last two years, it has shifted just in the way that the door has flung open wider to consider what that conversation around representation looks like. I can say that personally from folks wanted to publish what it is I have to say on my own terms, even being supported to do a one woman show that has this conversation on my own terms, the way that people are wanting, wanting some of that, even the idea that you've got businesses that understand that story is a practice and story is a way to engage you know, a diverse audience in its broadest sense because everybody has a story and that has value. Um, I will say that, I don't know if it's been on the news yet, but I believe it was yesterday, the first all African-American team did Everest for the first time ever um, in Nepal, the highest mountain in the world, right? And uh, you, there are things, I just think that there are, for whatever we want to, critique around what does it mean to climb the mountain and all that, we can have that conversation. But I think there's something about a moment where many of us are getting recognized as having something of value to add and actually making the point to say that it's not just we're not just value added. We have something of value to add to the larger conversation, but we are not simply value added, right? So what that means is, you know you want some of this, and now you want some of this on our terms. And we can kind of decide collectively with everyone in the room what we want those terms to be. Because I've been saying to people, I have to throw out the baby in the bathwater. If I'm talking to an institution or an organization that wants to shift things up but don't, doesn't know how to do it, I'm saying you don't have to get rid of yourself in order to make it happen. But you do have to get a new bathtub. You can't do it with the existing structures that are in place. I don't necessarily want to be included in something that's already broken. Why the heck would I want to be in something that's already broken? <laughs> and actually, we may have some new ideas. Many of us do. You know, what does it mean to create an emergent space, an emergent moment where we can show up and represent ourselves and be supported well? I mean, be paid well be given the infrastructure we need to do what we need, be given space to be able to heal and, and practice self-care. Because yes, the work of healing, and for me, not just healing for ourselves, but healing collectively this trauma, because for me, everyone in this country has been traumatized. We're not all traumatized in the same way. And that trauma looks different, but we've all been traumatized. There is no way you can come up in a country where we stole the land from the original peoples who was here. We built the backbone of the economy on another group. We've denied the experience of all different kinds of people from all walks of life who come here. And we still do that, right? Meantime, using the land and its resources for our own benefit, often with consideration for the land, you know, what that means in the long term, right? So we've all been traumatized. So what does it mean at this moment for those who have had the resources, the political power, the connections, and the leverage to say, okay, well, what can I do? And I'm saying, well, I got some ideas what you can do, you know, because you got some stuff, you know, and then we can figure out how to move forward together with that. Boom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to uh, follow up on a comment you made in that last question. And um, and you mentioned earlier about how this this work is is, is exhausting. Right. Um, and someone asked a question a while earlier about, you know, nature having the healing healing uh, effect on you or on people. And so I'm curious as for you. What are some of the things that um, you do to alleviate the exhaustion that you, you know, that you experience through this work? And, you know, what, what are some of those things that uh, practices and things that you do? Yeah, you know, and it's so funny because people ask me that question a lot and I, it's the place where I'm not really good at it. So I think about, you know, I've been really running the last four weeks and now I'm, I'm doing a lot of in-person stuff again, as well as other, and I'm so busy and I'm so tired. So I was like, oh my God, I, I love doing the work and I'm, I, it's hard for me to say no. And sometimes like, I'm not doing a single thing tomorrow. I'm not going anywhere. 
I'm not leaving my apartment for two days because I have to. I have to, and I have to almost t say it out loud to everybody so I can give myself a reason not to answer the 20 or 30 emails that I can just. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but actually I'm not going anywhere. And in, I don't, if I don't do nothing, that's okay. So sometimes it's claiming some time. Um, for me, the creative act is also healing and rejuvenating. You know, earlier today, I'm working with this wonderful Latinx person in theater who's helping me think about my performance piece of the N-word Nature Revisited, where I tell a fuller story of myself and my parents and my family on the land. Doing that creative work is energizing. For me, because that's for me, even though I'm going to, sh I'm sharing it with a public as another way to do this work. But it's also for me, you know, a lot of times when people ask me in the room, it's for them. And I understand they're like, you know, I did something earlier this week and they they need me to come in and talk about hope and possibility and the issues. And, and I'd love to do it and I do it. And But it's more for them than it is for me. You know, I mean, I get paid and all that, but, you know, this isn't even primarily about that, right? It's, it's for me, you know, it's an opportunity, you know, I'm privileged to be, to actively be on a journey of my own healing through my work. A lot of us don't get to do that. My parents didn't get to do that. You know, I would say a lot of people in the world have to work just to put food on the table, right? To, to feed their families, to make sure the rent is paid, to make sure they can, you know, pay their health bills, take care of everything like that. And, you know, sometimes they have to take the job that they're given, um, which doesn't mean they can't bring their whole selves to it. But, you know, I've gotten to a point where I get to do work. I get to select work that actually feeds me in that way. And so it's also about honoring, paying attention to my own gratitude and making sure that I'm showing the gratitude is also, I can't, it, it helps I don't b really believe so much in balance as much as I believe in, you know, a friend of mine, Kaylin Tutrees, who's an indigenous and black, she's indigenous and black, she's an artist, she's 75. She says to me, you know, the hardest thing to change is your own mind. Mm -hmm. And so I take that to heart for myself. Like when I find myself in a slump or angry or upset or, de or just depleted, you know, how do I change my own mind? Meaning maybe I just need to do something a little different. Maybe. Maybe I just need to hold that a little different. Or how do I forgive myself for, you know what, I didn't answer those 10 other emails or I didn't show up when, you know, somebody needed me here or, or I am simply not perfect anymore. I would forgive someone else for not doing it. So why wouldn't I forgive myself? Like, why I'm holding myself to some higher, you know, level. Like what's happening? I'm just a, a human being trying to meet everybody where they are. But it also means having to meet myself where I am, right? And I'm practicing it all the time. I don't always get it right. Um, on a completely more, uh, slightly more superficial side, I love watching movies and my series like you know i sometimes it you know i'm already tonight like you know apple tv netflix like you know i love my crime like there's so many sci-fi crime like sometimes it's just about indulging and it's you know it's an, you know, an indulgence i get to watch other stories for a while and just enjoy that and um you know cook myself something nice to eat and you know sometimes it's simple yeah what, what what you watching now that you you know that you that gives you life that you want to recommend? Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay, first of all, the show that's blowing my mind is the Man Who Fell to Earth, the remake. So I know you two are younger, so I'm gonna I'm gonna school you right now, just in case you didn't know. So, uh -huh. That's right. The the original Man Who Fell to Earth was the black actor. Joe Morton. It was, I believe it came out in like 79, 80. And you know Joe Morton because he was like in Speed. He was, they had police chief. He's been in so many movies. But one of the first movies he did was The Man Who Fell to Earth. And it's a story of, he's an alien coming from a dying planet. He has to inhabit a human body and find a way to save like their resources and the Earth's resources. It's called The Man. But in the original, I believe he falls to Earth. He's in Harlem. It's great. They had just remade the series with the black actor Chiwetel Ejiofor. And you know him. Man is yeah. brilliant. He's British. Br brilliant. Naomi Harris. Oh, my God. It's so good. The remake. Because it's wow. said in today that he oh, falls wow. to earth. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I believe it's on Showtime. It's about so good. Me. Okay. Showtime. Okay. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs>
So I'm <laughs> piggyback much. <laughs> I'm piggyback off of Raymond and something you mentioned as well. So you mentioned your favorite. You know, you sit sit back, take a weekend. You you know, watch something good. You make something food wise. That caught my attention. Right, Friday night. You know, conclusion of this. You're gonna relax. What is like? The, the Miss Finney comfort dish. Like, what what are you making as as a cook just to enjoy and really kind of send you off into the weekend? Because you know, for me, it's like, so, you know, I just got to know. I just got to know. Yeah, if I was, so I've been. I will say in 2020, one of the things I had to do for my health. I mean, my health has always been knock on wood, really good. But I gained some weight at the beginning of the pandemic. I live alone, so I was cooking like I was cooking for five people. But that was back in the day when you didn't think you could share your food with your neighbor because everybody yes. was like COVID, you know. So I'm eating everything I'm making, and I was like, five months into that, I went, oh no, we have to slow this roll. So I went on this diet for two and a half months where I cut everything out for a while: caffeine, alcohol, gluten, dairy. So I, I took it all out, lost some weight got my metabolism tight. And then I, you know, I could introduce some of those things back in in a more balanced way. So having said that, often on a Friday night, I would love, I will bake some salmon. I cook up some kale, you know, with some, I make it good. I'm telling you with garlic and everything, some wild rice. I cook, a, I bake a sweet potato. I have myself a glass of wine. But back in the winter time, because I live in Vermont, if I was really going to town when I could get it. now. The beautiful thing about where I live is there are a lot of farms. I mean, I'm a city girl, but I'm living in here right for the moment. But there's farms everywhere. So whether you eat meat or not, you can get in terms of, you know, fresh beef, pork, um, the eggs, the cheese, the bread, the vegetables. I mean, farm fresh. I live on the second floor of a two-story house. A young farmer, she lives below me. So she sometimes leaves me a bag of fresh vegetables. In the wintertime, when I could get oxtails, I would slow cook some, and I would make, because of my Jamaican friend, Audrey, mm -hmm. turned me on to, oh my God, some Jamaican oxtails with butter beans mm -hmm. and carrots. <laughs> yes. You have that with yep. some brown rice. I cook up some kale. That was, that's like my ultimate, that's like the ultimate right there. And then if I'm okay. really going the distance and I'm having a treat, because my mother is a tremendous baker, I would bake either my mother's, my mother makes a, a lemon pound cake. I make a lemon pound cake or her black walnut carrot cake. No raisins. Don't put raisins in the carrot cake. <laughs> yes, never. So good. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> yeah. Okay, I appreciate. No raisins that. in the carrot cake. No <laughs> raisins. Do not do that. <laughs> Don't play games like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't play. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of our uh, co uh, people watching asks, uh, "If you have a favorite U.S. national park, what is your favorite? Which which one of your?" Which one of those parks is your favorite, if you have one? Oh, I, and I missed it. Which which one of the parts of what is my favorite? I missed the... Oh, if you have a favorite national park, which one is it? Oh, oh man, I know. And, and people have asked me that question, and that's... I've been to a lot of them. When I served on the National Parks Advisory Board, we'd have meetings twice a year in the parks. So that was the first time I got to... Yes, on the salmon. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> um, um, oh, 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 I don't know that I have a favorite one. I think of, oh, that's hard because I, you know, the big ones, of course, are stunning. You know, I've been to Yellowstone and Grand Canyon um, and Yosemite, which, um, but I love them for different reasons. I love Yosemite because of Shelton Johnson, who is the Black Park Ranger there who brought the story of the Buffalo Soldiers back to life there. And he lived literally does a thing where he dresses up as a Buffalo soldier. And if you've never been to Yosemite, but if you ever go, the first thing you have to do is make sure that he's working there as the park ranger because he's amazing. Um, I often talk about, talk about Dr. Martin Luther King National Historic Site because I got to take my parents there. And so the story and the experience my father had in that park makes me hold that park in a particular way. So, you know, I've been to Glacier National Park, but on the Can Canadian side, um, 
So I know I'm not answering the question because I don't have a favorite. I, Biscayne National Park was amazing because I learned about Israel Lafayette Parson Jones, and that's where the park ranger Brenda Lanzendorf, who's no longer alive there, but when we were friends when she was working there, worked really hard to bring the story of that Black family and what they gave to that national park. So I don't know. Um, just last week, I was in Anacostia National Park in, in Washington, D.C., that I didn't know was a national park. It is the only park as national park in the country that's actually a community park. It is a, commu a community park because it is an African-American, it's largely African-Americans who come to it. Unlike most other national parks in the country, you get the visitors come in, they travel in, and then they leave. These people use the park every day, and it's a national park. And the superintendent, um, her first name is Tara, is African-American. And we, and we got to see a group of us, everything that they're doing in that park, fishing. The first black yacht club is across from that national park. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as a first black yacht club. And I'm, I'm like, a, and of course there is, right? That's what I'm saying. That's when I went, there's another story. Of course yeah. there is. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I know that's not answering that question straight because I don't have a favorite one. I just mm -hmm. love the experience of going to different parks. And for some, it's the natural beauty for me. For some, it's the people who work there and the stories that they tell of that place. And for some, sometimes I go and it's the experience that I personally have there. Because, you know, you when you're moved by something, you kind of come away with it. Um, yeah, I'm going to be in Denali uh, in in uh, uh, July. I, I've been invi invited to spend a week at Denali camp. You know, in the evening, I have to share stories about my own work. But in the day, I get to be there in, you know, in Denali and see that. And I'm sure it's going to be amazing. So I'm just down for the adventure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Wow. Well, before we kind of wrap up, um, I, I do want to uh, ask you about, and you mentioned it briefly earlier, but you want to share about your future projects. Um, I know you mentioned a memoir. I know you mentioned your one woman show. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about that or other things you're working on currently? Yeah. So three things. One is, you know, I've had this idea for a few years, um, at, you know, the N word nature revisited. And in part because, you know, people early on had asked, or, or talking a lot about John Muir, who's a major conservationist. And I didn't want to cancel John Muir out because he did some amazing work. What I wanted to do, he was also, he made some, said some racist things about black people early on in his early part of his nature travels and writings. Um, but he evolved over time. And I wanted to, to say, what would it be like if he and I had a conversation? And I started thinking, what would it be like you know, and he wrote a book, A Thousand Mile Walk Through the Gulf in 1867, where he spent a year and he walked through the southern states, you know, to see what it would, you know, what the landscapes were like. Um, and I and I imagined what, what if a black woman had done it? So I created a character, Sojourner Washington Douglas, and I called it A Thousand Mile Walk Was Rough in 1867, <laughs> you know, and just wanting to challenge, you know, do it with a little humor, but also with a little seriousness of not to diminish his experience as a white man on the landscape, but to imagine if you're a black woman on the landscape at the same time, it doesn't mean you can't appreciate the landscape but what you see, feel and experience is gonna look different for a variety of reasons. And so it's kind of morphed into me telling this sort of work in progress story of my family, moving through the world as a backpacker, understanding all these things and how it comes together within this larger context. And so I've only done it maybe six times, um, for different audiences. I did it in Rhode Island a couple of weeks ago because it's morphing itself and growing over time. I'm working on my second book, which is the book I always wanted to write, which was really the first one. As the Black author um, Alice Randall said to me, you need to call it Eat, Pray, Love, Black, you know, about all those years backpacking as yourself and what, you know, what that is, you know, why you did it and sort of of being out in the world and also just talking about questions of identity. I was adopted. So I've been really, you know, also wanting to find what does it mean to find my biological family and think about questions of biology and DNA and all the ways that we are black in America on the land. Um, and I'm working on that. And just somebody wrote me just yesterday, a uh, publishing company said, you know, they'd heard my story about my story of my family and they thought it would make a great children's book. And I'm going to write them back and say, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. 
Like, what would it mean to tell the story? I'm often thinking of myself as a child in that and growing up on that land because that's what I was, was a child. Mm -hmm. And for many of us, our first traumas in life happen when we are children, right? Someone said to me today, you know, that's when we were first scratched, you know, as, and, and we carry that a lot throughout our lives. So what would it mean for me to tell that story as a child to children mm -hmm. and as a children's book? So those are the three things I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, yeah. exciting stuff for sure. Yes. Um, yeah. On the topic of books, since we are a book club, we would love any recommendations of books that you have read recently that were that you really loved. Um, anything you want to share about uh, your reading, reading uh, picks? Yes. Yes, my um, I you know. Because I'm always on the move, I tend to read more. These days, I, I don't finish books like I used to do. I read essays and articles. But the book I did read this year that if you haven't read that I've been telling everybody because I love it is by the Black um, independent scholar, writer, visionary, Alexis Pauline Gums. And it's called Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. What this woman did, she's so bloody brilliant. She spent a year or maybe more than a year studying marine mammals. She's not, you know, by training, she's not a biologist, but she believed that marine mammals could tell us something about how we breathe and live in the world and how she could breathe and live in the world as a, a black queer woman, right? And doing that for herself. So you can read them. They're almost like meditations and they're brilliant. So she'll talk about one particular animal and how they survived. And then she'll talk about herself and us and how we survive. I'm telling you right here, Undrowned. Undra even the title, Undrowned. It's really neat. I just yeah. think it's brilliant. I have it, you know, um, I, I've been quoting her lately in a few things. I'm going to see if I can pull one up real quick, but I might not be able to because I, I don't, I wasn't planning to do it, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, shoot. I probably can't do it, but she, I want to, hold on, hold on. I can get it. I can get it. I can get it. I don't know. There's just too many things. I don't know if I can get it. Uh, maybe I can't get it, but I just wanted to sort of drop something. Yeah. Oh, this is what she says when she talks about what, who is this book for? She says, I wrote this book with you in mind. Dreamers that live near the shore and wonder about the whale bones you find. I wrote this with you in mind. Those of you lobbying at the United Nations about deep ocean ecology and what it takes to honor it. And you, the ones who can't keep from crying when you read the daily news. And you, the ones who feel cut off from nature. And you, the people who prioritize nature in your lives. And us, the people who are anxious about climate crisis. Us, the people who take long social media fasts and want peace. Yes. You and me, the ones who thought our practice of looking at pictures of marine mammals was completely separate from our economic justice work. This is for all of us. You are on my mind and in my heart. Wow. Wow. That's so, wow. wow. Yes. It's brilliant. That is, yes. Yeah, I, that yes. sounds. Wow. <laughs> It's good. I'm telling you, I wouldn't tell I, you if, if I did. If it wasn't true. Listen, yeah. I, I'm put, yeah, I have my library app open right now. I'll be there first. Well, tomorrow stays Friday, so no, I won't. I'll be there Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I will be getting that book. Okay. <laughs> awesome. uh, Corbin, you got a last question before we close it? You know, okay, yeah, I, actually, I do, Raymond. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's kind of funny. I mean, just this was one I'd written uh, like the very first question on my mind before I even dove into the book. And it's really interesting to see how far I've kind of come from that. But in my, my initial question was what advice, um, just knowing your background, knowing that you had been traveling and been around and like you said, backpacking, what advice would you give a person, this is myself whose interest and curiosity was definitely piqued um, after reading this book. But I, I guess one who stereotypically fits the profile of someone leery of the outdoors in regards to activities like hiking and camping. I've done both swimming. I've done that, but I'm always like hesitant to that, but I want to be more open and, and not buck a trend, if you will, but just be more, I don't know, in touch with the outdoors in that way. What, what advice could you give some, well, give myself, I would say someone like myself, but you just give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, I think that's a great question. And, and part of it, 
will rely upon what resonates for you in terms of ways of engagement. Meaning, for some people, it will be you know you know watching a couple of movies or reading a book or reading about some other people doing things. They'll find inspiration. But for some people, there's a lot of great groups. Um, like Outdoor Afro, like um, Latinos Outdoors, like Black Girls Hike. Black, I think there's one even called Black Girls Fish, uh, you know, Girl Trek, you know, which is one of the biggest, you know, nonprofits for black women in health. There are so many groups out there now of, uh, if we're talking very particularly about African-American people who I identify as black, yes. you know, that do all the things, hunting, fishing, swimming, walking you know who are out there so you can join a group you know for me often that's a good way in with people who you feel you have something in common with that you feel you can let down some of those barriers that we all have about you know things that we're concerned about afraid about uncomfortable about and sometimes what we're uncomfortable about is just the stuff we carry you know and you know will we be seen will we be supported will we know what to pay attention to and what not. What, what what happens when sometimes when we see something, will we have on, can we wear what we have? Is this good enough? Like my sneakers? Like, what do I need? Do I need money? Can I ask that question without humiliating or embarrassing myself? What, you know, all of that. There are so many groups out there now that are doing it, who have blogs, who are engaging in this. And that's what I would say to do. You could Google Black People in the Outdoors groups Back in 2003, when I hardly got anybody but Audrey Peterman and Earthwise Production, them days are over. Now you're going to get 20, 30, 40, you know, people are on Instagram. I mean, you know, Twitter, they're out there on social media. Um, uh, uh, Faith Briggs, a black filmmaker. I mean, there are so, James Mill. I mean, there's so many people I could spend an hour just going, and there's it. And, 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 so that's what I would suggest is, you know, and reaching out, reaching out to people, reaching out to groups, finding out what's happening where you are, because, you know, it's not about how much money you have in your pocket. Right. Yes. I understand that it helps when you can have financial support to go farther afield. But nature is everywhere. You know, it is right where you are, you know, and we will get surprised. It's like Anacostia National Park in D.C. I didn't even I knew all the other the national mall. I knew there was all this other stuff in D.C. I had no idea there was a community national park right there where you don't have to have a dime. People just come to it and can fish and and do what they do. And there, there was a roller rink. They, they had all these things happening. So it's finding out what's nearby um, okay. where you are. Thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate that. You're welcome. That that was a great answer. And I want to, if you want to expand on that, do you have any last thoughts or parting words for our viewers about anything you wanted to address that you didn't get to address earlier? I would just say, you know, any parting words, just that, you know, one of the things that I often say in talks is I, I reference the um, African American civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson, who I've just I you know I hope someday I get to meet him. He seems like an amazing individual, and many of you probably have heard of him and just don't realize that you have if you don't know him. The documentary True Justice, and the movie with Michael B. Jordan, you know, who I like to say, you know, the actor from Wakanda, like a, <laughs> Wakanda is a real place. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. You know, uh, you know who played him, and I saw him like uh, Brian. Stevenson, the real guy in the documentary, and somebody asked him, why do you do the work that you do? And he works to get black men and teenagers off death row. And so he's been to the Supreme Court five times. And when the interview asked him, why do you do what you do? The first thing he said, I, I do it. Because like me, he, he's, not, he's not married, he doesn't have a partner, he doesn't have kids, he works all the time. And I say the same thing. That's, I was like, oh yeah, we're the same age. We were born literally one day apart. You know, I discovered, I was like, oh, I was like, I got, <laughs> so when they asked him why he does what he does, he said, I do what I do because the system is broken. And then he paused a little bit and he said, well, I do what I do because people are broken. And then he paused again and he said, I do what I do because I'm broken too. And, and I, that laid me out because I said, and that goes back to what you said at the very beginning, or I heard you ask me about self-care and that it is... I want to say our right as human beings, you know, 
When this country was founded, one of the biggest mistakes I think we made beyond stealing this land from the indigenous people was framing the conversation about nature as though we as human beings are outside of that nature. And that's the first mistake. Indigenous people didn't make that mistake. The rest of us made that mistake. And ever since then, we've seen ourselves outside of it, except um, uh, instead of imagining ourselves as part of it, right? And layer on top of that is black people all the ways we've been told we are not part of it and everything else for so long, you know, we've worked that into our own psyche so much that we've internalized that in many different ways, which isn't to say that we all should camp. I don't always like to camp. You know, that doesn't mean we all have to like everything that we are being offered to do. But it is our right because we are part of nature to be in that. It, it is there for us. We cannot survive without it. Right. We can't survive without the, the clean air. We can't survive without the food we put in our bodies. We have a right to enjoy it. And even if it's just sitting on a stoop in the sun, you know, we have a right. You know, because we are here, we are part of that. And so that's what I would leave. And it heals. It heals the planet. It heals. It can heal systems and collectives and it can heal ourselves. Right. And if we want to show up for others, I think we can only do that if we too are also healed. So those are the last words I want to leave. And oh, and have fun doing it. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, wow. This, this has been great. This has been amazing. Uh, yes. I want to thank you, Dr. Finney, for joining us today, this evening. Um, for those who have not picked up a book yet, pick up black faces, white spaces um, today. Um, again, this was <laughs> our uh, book club pick of the month. We're having a dis our book clubs actually having our discussion on the book May 22nd, two o'clock, uh, sun Sunday, two o'clock p.m. Eastern time. So we're looking forward to that conversation. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Finney, for being with us. Uh, thank you all who joined us uh watching the discussion and we will see you all next time y'all take care bye-bye thank you thank you